Hello, and welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast, where it's not about getting the gig, it's about enjoying it. I'm Tanner Gus, and I'm so excited to have you with me here today. Before we get into it, I, as always, want to say thank you to all the happy musicians out there supporting this show. Everyone sharing posts on social media, wearing happy musicians clothing on your body or drinking out of happy musician mugs and hanging up positivity posters in your room means a lot. And especially thank you to those of you leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Not only is it the most effective way to help this show grow and fight back against the algorithm, but I comb through each one like a vinyl junkie on record store day, and there's a chance that I will read yours on each week's episode, like this short and sweet one from JJ Juice Man. Yeah, baby, five stars. And that's what I'm talking about. So today we are talking about mindfulness, and I know that's kind of a loaded term these days. There's Netflix specials coming out, and every podcast has to cover it. And there are a lot of people talking about it and not a lot of people practicing it. And I have just found myself completely overwhelmed by it all and not really sure what it means. And honestly, like there's only ever been one person who I felt like explained it in a way that made sense. And that's our guest today, Frank Diaz. I've been trying to get him on the show since day one and we finally worked it out and I'm super excited. He has been a scholar, practitioner and teacher of mindfulness from both a sacred and a secular approach for decades now, and he's the real deal. First, Frank's gonna walk us through a mindfulness exercise to get us a taste of what we're dealing with today. And then we go through breaking down what constitutes a serious mindfulness practice and how you can incorporate that into your musical studies. And along the way, I pepper spray him with all kinds of things I've been hung up on trying to wrap my head around all this and specifically the overlap between deep listening and experiencing art and how that relates to mindfulness. So I'm so glad you are here and I appreciate you offering your time and your attention to this show. I hope you enjoy it and please help me welcome Frank Diaz. Frank Diaz, welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast. All right, thanks for having me. Good to see you, Tanner. Yeah. so we just talked a little bit about starting this whole thing with uh, with a little exercise. Um, uh, I think you called it a performance anxiety exercise, and uh, th- that that'll work. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's uh, it's an exercise I use in um, in my mindfulness classes or with uh, students who are um, who are feeling sp- uh, very specifically physiological sort of anxiety. Uh, where their hands are trembling or they can't maybe their minds in an okay place uh but but their bodies are kind of freaked out and uh mm-hmm. so it's, it's called 478 i did not come up with it uh it it's uh it's an adaptation of an old yoga pranayama technique uh that i think got passed on to um uh, andrew wheel who wrote uh, about it in a book many years ago and okay. then you know has sort of made its way but 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 it's part of a larger sort of group of practices that um, are, are called vagal toning practices, um, which I can explain later. But yeah, here's a basic exercise. So if, uh, if you just kind of want to find a comfortable spot on your chair and kind of find, you know, how you hold your body matters a little bit in during this exercise. Um, so, you know, maybe find good balance using your sit bones. You kind of rock left and right. Find a good spot where you feel balanced, but not tense. Elongate your spine just a tiny bit. So you kind of lift yourself up a bit. Again, no more than needed. Just just to sort of stabilize and feel like you're slightly lifted. It helps to think of somebody lifting you from the top of your head just a bit. And the point of all this is to allow breath to come in freely into your body. So right now, just take a nice deep breath into your belly and release it. Another deep breath in, and release it. Before we start the actual exercise, just allow your body to settle a little bit. And one way to do this is to sort of become aware of gravity as you're sitting. Just, you know, you can just sort of shift your mind and go, yeah, I'm being pulled into my chair. I like to put my feet on the ground too. It keeps me grounded. It makes me feel like I'm quite 
quite literally grounded. And so there's kind of gravity pulling you down and you're kind of pushing up against it, right? So it's this nice little tug and pull of, of relaxation, but alertness. Kind of find that nice balance. And then you do this with your eyes open. There's no need to close your eyes when you do it. And the basic technique that we'll do, uh, we'll do a couple of iterations of this is we're gonna inhale through our nose for four counts. And we have to imagine that we're breathing into our bellies. So it really helps to do that. So it's not a chest kind of breath. It's a very deep, deep breath into your body. Um, and, and even if uh, you know that's not exactly what's happening physiologically, you wanna imagine that that's what's happening. So your belly expands a little bit. You breathe in for four, you hold your breath for seven counts. It's not tight. It's just a nice sort of suspension of the breath, right? So, you, you know, the difference between holding it and suspending where it doesn't come out, right? So you want to think more of suspension. And then on the exhalation, this is really critical. You're going to breathe out for eight counts, but you're going to put your tongue behind your teeth, like that, and that's going to offer a little bit of resistance to the air so it doesn't all come out at the same time, right? So that those eight counts are going to you're gonna hear a little whoosh. And it's really important to try to get that whoosh sound. Um, doesn't work quite as well without that. We'll do a few cycles of that and then lead to a little um, mindfulness sort of uh, awareness task at the end, and then we can go from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the tempo. And let's go ahead and start to breathe in now. And one, two, three, four, hold. Five, six, seven, whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then relax. Just let your body come back to normal. Let air come back into your body. Let's try another cycle of that. In for four, hold for seven, whoosh, out for eight. Ready? And in. Hold. Whoosh. Relax. Let air come back into your body. Let's do two more. Ready? And in. Hold. Whoosh. One more together. And in, fill up all the way, hold. Whoosh. And go ahead and do one on your own without me counting. And when you get to the end, just sort of relax your body, your shoulders, your neck. And then just for a few moments, just kind of become aware of the sounds in the room. Just kind of notice the sounds in the room and anchor your attention on those sounds. Let yourself breathe naturally. And kind of with that attitude of having a, an open awareness and a relaxed body, go ahead and open your eyes if they were closed and come right back into the room. So that's four, seven day or uh, vagal toning. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. I, had, I had the mindfulness thing at the end. That's uh, right. An extra little touch, but that's basically it. Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, it feels fantastic. I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to approach talking about breathing techniques and just, I'm really curious just about mindfulness with you today. Every, I mean, it's just a kind of, I guess, a, a trope at this point, every podcast has to have a mindfulness episode and there's yeah. Netflix specials on it and it's everywhere. And I am always afraid of running the risk of like, I don't know what mindfulness is like, and there are a lot of people that are talking about it all the time. Yeah. I'm hoping you can help me kind of get a sense, <laughs> like, what what is mindfulness? Yeah. You'd, you'd be in good company if you don't know what it is. So uh, I, I'm glad you acknowledge that. Um, that. That's part of the problem, right, is that we're, we keep using this word, but you know, every time you hear somebody talk about it, it it's different. Mm -hmm. And, you yeah. know, I've heard iterations, you know, you know, mindfulness is about sending kindness to yourself and, and it's about stress reduction. It's about all that. And, you know, it, it can, it can do any of those things. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what my view of it is and mm -hmm. how it applies to mu musicians specifically or Perfect. in life, if you want to do it that way. I also want to say that the exercise that I just worked with you on um, is actually part, it's a link that I used uh, to teach mindfulness because one of the problems with the whole mindfulness movement and idea is that we use the word mind. Mm -hmm. And for Westerners, for folks who grew up in our culture and Euro European modernist scientific cultures, mind means brain and thought. Right. But, but the problem with that is that mind, at least from the conception of the folks who um, um, developed the mindfulness, uh, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, depending on how you want to measure that, uh, to the modern day and how it was used is, is that mindfulness is really an embodied practice as well. The body mm -hmm. is the mind, the mind is the body, the body is the environment. We don't really make those artificial distinctions uh, when we're talking about mindfulness the way that it was practiced uh, thousands of years ago, even if today we're going we're gonna to practice it in a different context, meaning back then it was practiced as, uh, it was part of a religious practice. Um, it was part of Buddhist practice. Buddhist monks used mindfulness uh, not to relax, not for wellness, but because it was a way of monitoring their mind, body, and emotions mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that they could be consistent with the kinds of ethical vows that they have taken. So, so one really simple way of putting this is mindfulness used to be uh, about um, about taking stock of what's happening right now in our minds, bodies, and environments, and making sure that we are uh, consistent uh, with the kind of human being we want to be and the kind of perceptions that we want to have. It had a very ethical core to it. So it wasn't so much like changing who you are as a way to like actually get in touch and assess how you're being so that you can then make an actual judgment of where you're at. That's a lovely way to put it. And that's, and, and here's the confusing part. That was one way mindfulness was used, right? Okay. But yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, you know, but, but remember these are monks, right? So they've taken mm -hmm. certain vows. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. they've said, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I pledge to be kind to people. I pledge not to abuse um, uh, my work or my relationships or, right. There's all these vows that you take. Now that's great. You can say that theoretically, right. But then now you have to enact it in the world. And so mm -hmm. to a monk well-being, right. Or, or being aligned with, 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 um, a purpose in life is aligned with their particular religious or ethical view. Right. So it's not just, I'm relaxed, you know, I, should I be mindful when somebody's stealing uh, a uh, a donut from from somebody on the street? I don't know why a donut came up. But you get the idea, right? We can confuse. I would be very mad about like, that. You know, I'm in a state yeah. of zen or whatever that means. But but you're right. It, it was a way of monitoring what is going on in your body and mind so that you can enact a particular way of thinking and being and feeling in the world. But it's it's it happens very differently, right? Because as you said, you you. You monitor, you go, what is this thing that I'm experiencing right now? And how does that align with the kind of person I want to be? And so in a way, it takes you out of reactivity, right? It keeps you from being mm -hmm. reactive. Now, the tools that were used can be talked about psychologically, and that's sort of what I want to make an argument about. Almost every mindfulness practice that is a serious mindfulness practice, one that is really founded on the tradition and even in modern clinical context, you know, with the science um, and, and, and what the mechanisms of mindfulness actually do essentially have 
a common set of processes that they use. So I like to think of mindfulness as a family of practices okay. that have certain characteristics. Um, and those characteristics are pretty easy to understand because we experience them every day. One is attention. What am I paying attention to right now, right? So mm -hmm. every mindfulness practice tells you to orient yourself in a particular way. For example, some practices tell you just be attentive to the present moment, like actually stay right here and notice what's going on right now. So your field of awareness is stabilized on the present moment. What's the present moment? Your thoughts, your mind, where you are, everything. I'm just kind of, I'm going from a state of reaction to, whoa, what's happening right now, right? Okay, yeah. Other mindfulness practices tell you what? Focus on your breath. So oh, find a breath, right? Um, and so they're giving you a very narrow sort of focus. But here's what those two things have in common. Two things they have in common is that they're asking you to deliberately attend to something. They're asking you to go from a state of a sort of reactivity and, and you know, non-thinking, non to, to whoa, right? I'm aware. I'm, I'm, in my, I'm in my body. So if a mindfulness practice doesn't do that, if it doesn't give you a focus of awareness or a place to stabilize, I, I, you can call it mindfulness, but I'm not sure how that would be. Uh, I, I don't know where that foundation would come from. The other thing it asks you to do is, is to engage in something called awareness, right? So you can focus like anything in our environment right now. I can use any of my senses to focus on a part of that particular thing while being aware of everything else that's going on around you, right? So right now, uh, you know, Tanner, we're having a conversation, but if a lion were to go into your room right now, I, I would hope you would notice that lion, right? You have awareness <laughs> going on and you go, hey, we got to stop this podcast. We got to go. Right? <laughs> can I get, can I have five real quick? Sure. Um, no, I meant that would be with the line. <laughs> yeah. right, so if you've got this attention going on, if you got, so you, you're attending to me right now, we hope, um, uh, but, but there's also this awareness, right? So in mindfulness, you keep that space of awareness open. You're monitoring, but what are you monitoring for, right? And the key is you're monitoring your emotions. You're monitoring activity. It, you're not actively engaged in it, but, but you're, it's there. It's informing what? what you, how you're relating to the present moment, right? And really like emotions, like one of the things we often don't notice about ourselves is that things in our attention, whatever we're paying attention to seems very different depending upon our emotional state, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Nothing has, so like, you know, if you think about food, for example, right? Food, depending upon my, what my body signal is telling me is either, oh my gosh, I've got to have that, I'm craving it, or I don't want that. The food doesn't have any inherent value, right? It's just that my emotions are coloring that. Now, why does that matter? It's because when you notice that your emotions are, are in a particular state, you have a chance to decide if that emotion is an accurate or a useful depiction of what's going on right now. Mm. So, you know, I pick up the musicians, I pick up my horn and I, I, I don't want to play right now. And I could go, well, I don't want to play. I'm just going to go somewhere else. Or I can pick up my instrument and go, wait a minute, I'm feeling this thing, right? And, and I don't know why I'm feeling this thing. Well, you don't know why, but the fact is if I continue to feel this thing, I might not be able to practice <laughs> because mm -hmm. I have such aversion to it. And maybe tomorrow it goes away, right? What mindfulness gives you the opportunity to do is go, oh yeah, I noticed that, that I'm feeling this way. What can I do about it? And we'll get to that later. What can I do yeah. about it is a big part, right? So you got right. attention, you got awareness of everything. And then there's a really, really important element of this. There, there's four actually, but th this is the third one is uh, we call this process decentering or dereification. Um, it's a fancy term that we use in, in um, uh, psychiatrists use it. It's also a philosophical term. Dereification is the ability to see things as uh, real, but not necessarily true. So I have a thought of a banana, okay? <laughs> uh, it's a thought of a banana. Maybe my body triggers a response right? I have a thought, a bad memory from the past. I'm projecting to the future. Those are thoughts. We all have thoughts. You cannot get rid of your thoughts. And some of your mm -hmm. thoughts choose you, right? But when we're aware that a thought is choosing us or that a thought is just coming up, we have an opportunity to go, wait a minute, that's just a thought. I'm not that thought. Yeah. That thought is arising in my awareness. So the relationship changes where the thought is part of the larger environment and you're not trying to reduce yourself to that particular thought. You're saying, oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm having a thought that I really dislike that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. I don't know why I dislike him, right? So I've got this emotional thing. I've got a thought that's, oh, I dislike him because they're a bad person. No, that, that, 
whatever it might be, you can pause and go, wait a minute, is this ridiculous? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where is this coming from, right? And so it's the beginnings of a sort of deep self-inquiry where you can go, yeah. And so that's another third tool, right? And then the, the final one, which I think is really, really impo- important is that we not only monitor our emotions, but that we enact a type of what, what we call neutral or positive disposition, right? So, you know, mindfulness is always about staying in an either curious state, like instead of saying, well, that's bad, you can change that to, I'm curious about that. Mm. Why is that happening? I'm acknowledging it. I'm not fighting it, right? So there's an attitude that's sort of neutral or or positive. Like when, when you do an, uh, like a positive emotion, a mindfulness, like a, a, a mindfulness meditation that has like a meta practice, which is sort of like I direct good energy or happy thoughts at somebody, then you're evoking a positive emotion, right? You're trying to generate that in your body and your mind, right? Mm-hmm. You put those four things together and almost every mindfulness practice, no matter what you call it, has some element of that in their directions. Some are a little bit more explicit than others. Some are yeah. less explicit than others. Um, and and the outcome, and here's here's the, the, the punchline, right? Mm-hmm. None of those things matter if you don't start with an intention for why you're doing the mindfulness task. Mm. Right? It's like, so, imagine being dropped off in a gym and somebody says, just keep lifting these weights. Yeah, you're probably going to get strong after a while. But if you don't know why you're there, if nobody tells you, hey, lifting weights is good for your health or uh, lifting, you're lifting weights because you want to become a good athlete, right? The intentional framing of what you do when you do mindfulness really matters. Um, and a perfect example of this is, I can use mindfulness to become a better sharpshooter. Mm-hmm. That military does that. You actually can train people to focus on a, ta- on, on a target, be aware of their environment and, and monitor for any kind of emotions that might get in the way, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, let go of any de- reified thoughts like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to shoot this person or this thing, right? Sorry to get graphic, right? right. And then right. you get good at that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think if the Buddha were around, I mean, not that that Buddha, that mindfulness is necessarily Buddhist, although right. Buddhists use mindfulness. I think there'd be a problem with that, right? Yeah. And so, so the answer to that is asking yourself, maintaining curiosity about who you are, but also maintaining an intentional set and saying, I'm doing this right now, even if the purpose is I just want to discover something about myself right now, or I really am doing this because I want to be kinder. So or you I'm can doing- set your own intention. There isn't yeah. like a prescribed, this is what your intention should be. And that's something people get wrong about mindfulness and its psychological mechanisms and why some people drop out. They think if I just do this breathing exercise or this focus exercise, everything's going to be great. Well, Mm -hmm. no, because what you choose to focus on and the emotions that come up as you focus on them matter. And if you're, and you know, let's say for example, that, that you, um, that in your focus, you bring in you notice that there's, you know, this thought keeps occurring, right? And, and it's actually a thought about some injustice in the world. And so if you're not careful, you'll go, oh, that's just a thought. I just have to disengage and I'll be better. And which means you don't act on it. You don't do anything. And maybe yeah. that's against your moral values or the kind of human being you are. And all of a sudden you're like, man, I don't feel better. Mm-hmm. Because we can't confuse bypassing the world and where we're in with with mindfulness. Mindfulness is not a way to bypass experience. It's a way to see it clearly clearly and then act upon it. And that's what makes you well. It's not that you always have happy thoughts and feelings. You're like some blissful Zen guy. It's that you get to look at your life and decide, what do I want to do with this moment? Mm, That's awesome. And okay. (laughs) I've been thinking a lot about that specifically this idea of like self-awareness, like finding yourself gets talked about a lot. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times it turns into this thing where at some random point in your thirties, you just like figured out who you are. And now it's like, <laughs> I just eat these foods. These are the foods I like. This is the music I listen to. These are yeah. the people I'm friends with. And you just form this rigid of like this, at uh, one day you figured it out and that's who you are. And it more always is, it seems to me, the more I have these conversations that finding yourself is like a daily opportunity. Like you can find out who you are. And the, and the dangerous part about the first one is that you just decide like, maybe you have negative personality traits that are harmful to people, but you're just like, that's who I am. Like, that's just who I am. That's who I will always be instead of, okay, that's who I am today. I've, you, 
through mindfulness, I become aware of that, but I can change that. So not only is that who I am today, that's who I am in a particular context at a particular time and in a particular ah, yeah, yeah, style, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so by the way, you know, you're not going to escape having tendencies that are negative in certain situations. This is yeah. not, I mean, you can't get past that. You do have some things about, everybody has a set of tendencies, mental habits, cognitions, emotions that, that are helpful in certain situations and not helpful on the other. So mm -hmm. notice how I'm sort of creating a, a little bit of a more relational matrix here, right? Yeah. And, and so, so when we're trying to find a self in this mix, where is that self, right? Um, uh, uh, what am I that right now, the conversation we're having, I'm enacting a particular self. Um, mm -hmm. if we were off camera, I might be a little looser. So that's a different kind of, I might bring something else into that. I have an eight year old daughter, certain mm -hmm. things I can't enact about myself. Right? <laughs> the quest for finding a solid sense of self that never changes based on anything is, it, it sounds reasonable, but when you look at your own experience, you realize that isn't there. Now, I want to be clear. It's not to say you don't have a body and a mind and tendencies. Of course you do. And some of those come from your culture. Some of those come from your from your dispositions, uh, from your brain biology. It's all there, right? Um, and, and some of them, again, some of them you really like, some of them you don't, some of them work, some of them don't, right? Mm -hmm. but, but what you can choose is a set of values to live by. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't have to become a nihilist, <laughs> yeah. You know, because I can see and say, well, if there's no core me, then why do I care? And then anything goes. That's not what I'm saying, right? Um, you say that, and 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 then it's like anything goes. No, it, do it doesn't mean anything goes. It just means we're in the act of being mindful in our lives about who we are. We realize, for example, I have a tendency to be sarcastic. Now that you know, among certain people, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, no one, you know, no one's going to be offended by it. You know. Um, certain people, it's going to hurt them because they don't know who I am. Among my, you know, in front of my eight-year-old, I can, I, you know, am I going to tell my dad? Well, I'm just start. Daddy's just sarcastic. No, I'm a you know, because that actually hurts her feelings when I'm sarcastic with her. So I have to go. Wait a minute. I'm not sarcastic. I have the tendency to be sarcastic, sarcastic in certain settings, and doesn't harm anyone. But in this case, it does. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so then I don't enact sarcasm. So where did the sarcasm go? It was never there. It was just such, you know, do you get it? Like, where yeah. does that go? It's not in a little drawer in my brain that's constantly acting, right? Yeah, like a, just, you're picking that tool off the shed. Yeah, it, it, there isn't, uh, you know, again, how, and this is a big debate in psychology. And I, and I, I would say that I'm on the more of the fringe side. I'm not even going to say fringe. I'm going to say my, my conception of psychology of modern psychology is, is is very much about the mind and the body in flux in the environment. It, it's hard to stabilize. And so a lot of times the way that we've been taught that we are is that they're fixed things in the world. And if mm -hmm. we just figure out the right relationship between you and that fixed thing, you're going to be happy. Well, you know, you just mentioned the great one, right? Like, what, 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 well, who am I when I'm 30? I figured no one's figured this out. By the way, they're telling you they figured it out. I, I'm always really skeptical of people that tell you they have figured it out. Is what that usually means is I think this is good enough for now. Mm. Like, yeah, I, I was going to be the conductor of the New York Philharmonic when I was 18 years. Just ask me, you know, that's what I wanted. I thought that would make me happy. And I, and I envisioned the world. And then when I didn't, that didn't happen because my proclivities and cult, you know, life situation didn't lead there. I was left to two things. I'm a failure and I'm going to chase this dream, or maybe uh, I'm just better suited for other things based upon my life and environment, what I can change. Right. And so there's a kind of, of, of flexibility there that mindfulness offers you. If you really practice it, that says, you know, yeah, I can have goals. I can have things I want to uh, uh, go for, but, but if they don't happen, um, it was still worth pursuing that goal. And there are mm -hmm. other things I can do. I'm not stuck in one particular perspective of something. Right. And so th this is part of wellness, right? It's uh, you, you went to the Jacob school. Yeah. What is one of the problems at the Jacob school? You come in and immediately you have an image of who you think you need to be usually uh, created by your past, by your professor, and then by the culture that the students have and the faculty have. And then when you don't meet that, you get sad, you get lonely, mm -hmm. you work too hard when maybe the problem wasn't you. Maybe the problem was you were never designed to be the principal chair of so-and-so and that's okay. 
there are mm. other things that are worthwhile in life that you could get out of school that that don't depend on you being the first chair or the concerto winner or whatever that might be. And so in mindfulness, we get to look at that and go, is that mine? Did I come up with that? Or is that just something I've never questioned about myself? Mm. That's right? awesome. Yeah. So 30, I'm a totally different person right now in many ways than I was when I was younger. Of course, there's some continuity. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that at age 50, 60, I'm going to have different goals for my life. Mm -hmm. That's okay. For sure. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all awesome. I'm really curious about, I mean, so mindfulness, you've studied very intentionally and studied it from like a practice side and also from a psychological side. And I'm sure that affects your relationship with it. Do yeah. you think that as just a general practitioner, how do you think about some of these more secularized, like Western versions of yeah. what mindfulness is? Like, what is there still value to them? And would you encourage them? And like, how, how would you go about introducing someone to mindfulness in like a practical way that an everyday person can can use it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So for uh, so you you asked three really good related questions there. Um, so yeah, I'm a scholar in mindfulness. I'm also um, I also have training a, as a Buddhist teacher. So you know I do I have practiced this since I was 18, and I teach it to people. And and, and a sort of you know I'll just go ahead and call Buddhism a religion, although I often think of it more as a philosophy and a psychology. But okay, it it, it counts, right? It has practices <laughs> and deities, I guess you know. Um, so in that setting, I teach it differently um, because it has a it has a different purpose, right? But, but getting back to what I said earlier, the processes are pretty simple. There are four processes, right? Attention, mm -hmm. awareness, letting go, and, and a neutral affect, right? Okay, so now, how do I teach this to, to folks in a secular manner? Well, the first thing to say is those four things are things we all do anyway. When you do it with mindfulness, you do it more deliberately. You combine them in a particular way, right? Um, and um, instead of liber you know, I can say from a Buddhist perspective, you know, compassion, the liberation of everyone's suffering is a big thing for Buddhists, right? We, you know, uh, uh, especially the, the the Zen tradition that I belong to. What you do, you know, you, you take vows that you will, for the rest of your life, do what you can to help other people suffer less. Mm -hmm. Now you can get rid of it, but but you know that's an intention, right? So use mindfulness in a way to sort of check yourself and make sure that you're following that path, right? Now. I can't go in front of a classroom and say, we're here to liberate all beings from stuff. <laughs> you might be an atheist, you might be Christian, you might be Muslim, you might be, I mean, there's something, of course, that's what I get in my class, right? But what I can tell folks is say, hey, look, what do you really care about? What brings joy in your life? What, what makes you feel like a, like a good person? And what you discover through that is that there are differences, of course, but, but a lot of us share some common things. We realize that being kind to people is better than being a jerk. Mm -hmm. We realize that that um, being generous is better than being stingy for the most part, even when we know that you know stinginess can help, uh, you know, can help us make more money sometimes, right? There are all these things, and, and again, I'm not there to monitor that for you, except unless you said I really want to beat everybody at, the, you know, and then I'd be like, well, you you could do that, but why use mindfulness to do that? It's like taking a Benadryl <laughs> to sleep. You can sleep if you take a Benadryl. But the purpose of a Benadryl is it's an antihistamine, right? <laughs> like you should take it for allergies and maybe you sleep, right? And mindfulness you can take for, for getting better at something, but it has a bigger purpose. Okay. So when I teach it, there are a couple of things. I don't do a lot of theoretical explanation okay. of what it is. I mean, I basically take people, I explain a little bit sometimes, and then I take people right into the practice and I make it about their experience right there in that moment. And I guide them and I ask questions and I say, okay, great. And, and remind them to keep an open mind and say, this is a journey. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So like, if you took my mindfulness class, which starts in two weeks here at, at IU, um, it's a very slow process. And I, and what I do is it's like any other training. I, the first thing you need to know is learn how to calm your body down a little bit. So we do four, seven, eight. We learn how to do that. Then we say, okay, now you've calmed your body. Let's see if we can just hold, anchor our awareness or attention on our breath. So it stabilizes the mind. It keeps it from flying all over the place to places that maybe we don't need to be right now, right? Mm -hmm. Once you stabilize the mind, then you can, you can sort of be aware of other things. It's like, oh, now that I have a stable spot, right? I can be aware of my emotions, of my intentions, of my thoughts. And then once we do that, then we start talking about now that I know that, how do I um, question these thoughts and these things such that they, I can let go of the things that 
aren't really about me and my world right now and, and, and aren't useful or helpful to me? And how can I enact things, intentions that are really more aligned with the kind of person I want to be? Right? And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a long process and it's something you're not going to get out of an app five minutes a day. I mean, you're just not, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you wanted to use mindfulness for relaxation, you could, but it, it's again, it's the Benadryl thing, right? Mm. Uh, uh, you know, it's, or, or yeah, I always think of alcohol. Yeah, alcohol will help you fall asleep. Probably better ways. Yeah. Okay. And so the, like the relaxation is sometimes turns into the goal instead of seeing it as a side effect of a greater goal, which is being more aligned with what you want your life to be like, because you have the ability to better assess that. Yeah, you're 100%. You're, you're confusing or folks will confuse a process with an outcome. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, why does, why does settling, you know, and relaxation is really not, I mean, no one's that relaxed through mindfulness. Um, I would say it's more of a balance between alertness. It's relaxed alertness, mm. right? Uh, it's mindful. So it, it, it does have an element of, of presence and energy, but it's not scattered energy, right? It's kind of, right? So, yeah. so you need to be real. If your mind is so tense that you're sticking to, you're so loose that it's everywhere, it's impossible to do mindfulness, right? Okay. It's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, there's analogies to bamboo. Mm. Right? It's steady enough that it ain't going to break, but it also sways in the wind. Right, mm -hmm. and your mind, you, you sort of, or, or uh, tuning the the classic metaphor is tuning a string. You know, if I take a string up and, and I over tune it, if it, I'm sorry, if I stretch it too much and make it too tight, it's gonna pop. If I make it too loose, it's not gonna make a sound. There's a nice spot where it's just, just right. Yeah, where it produces, you know, something that that is um, concordant. It's music, or it has the potential to become music. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what what mindfulness trains you to do through these processes. Well, and it seems to me that the relaxation is almost a byproduct of like being aware and observing yourself, but with, but from a curious mindset instead of a judgmental mindset and criticism. And I think that's the mindset that I lived in and most music students live in, in school is constant hyper criticism of yourself and what you sound like and what that means about your value as a person and your career prospects. And it, cycles out of control 100 and so is like how can you use mindfulness to combat that in a school setting like for students what what do you think like a good yeah practice routine or something would be when to do it or, or like how to address that you know what i mean yeah you 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 really uh, have pinpointed what the value of this practice is uh in many ways um uh, so, so let's, let's, let's unpack that a little bit and, okay, and cool. talk about it. So practically speaking, I mean, there are practices that deal with negative self-talk. I mean, negative self-talk is part of mindfulness because everything is part of your, you know, negative self-talk shows up where in your awareness. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so why is that there? Well, how did that get there? And what do we do about it? Right. So to answer one question is when, do, when do you practice mindfulness? You can practice it before you practice. You can do it in your daily life just remind yourself, oh, can I be mindful while I walk? And be mindful, mm. you know, sort of do what we call informal practice. Or you could do meditative practices that sort of train those muscles. You know, that's the, that's the, I go to the gym so I can run faster because I'm an athlete, but I also have to go run faster in order to see whether what I did at the gym is actually going to work. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't just stay at the gym, right? So, so, you know, it's all those things. Okay, but, but let's talk about self-talk because you're 100% right. We have accepted as a culture, many of us have an internalized idea that in order to be good at what we do, we must compare ourselves to others and we must succeed in a particular way. That is so ingrained in us yeah. um, that, that it is difficult to see, to go where, how did that get in there? How did that get in my mind to the point that I don't even question that anymore, right? So how does mindfulness contribute to that? Well, imagine, remember what we said before, once your mind, you went to learn to calm your body a little bit focus your mind and become aware, what starts to happen is then you start noticing that thought, right? So I'm going to pick up my instrument, right? And, and uh, I, I'm not being mindful when I pick up my instrument. And again, that thought emerges. Now, what's interesting about what you start to notice is that your body, mind, thoughts, and experiences kind of link together in a way. It's almost like they glue to each other, right? So, so we build associations, 
not because the associations are necessarily true all the time or meaningful. It's because that's just what came together. For example, one day I am having a terrible practice. I just, things aren't working well. Mm -hmm. I'm 16 years old, let's say, I'm, and things aren't working well. And, and it's just, you know, it really, it, that, it really had to do with I didn't sleep the night before. Okay. I'm building a bad association. It, it, and I'm thinking, boy, I'm just not practicing hard enough. And then your, your, your teacher comes into your practice room and says, oof, boy, having a rough day, huh? Auditions are coming up. Okay, let's just take that simple little thing. You have now fused judgment from your teacher, a sense that you're not practicing enough, a bad day, mm -hmm. right? And have decided those three things are now linked together. Your brain goes, woof, I got to get, right? And then you don't think about it. The next time you go in and play, all you need is one of those little triggers. All you need is the horn and all of that is triggered, right? But you forget that those other things were just in the last context. You're stuck on them. You're, you're kind of like reifying them, making them part of who you are. Instead of going, that was last time. This is now. Mm -hmm. I have a new story, right? Okay, but now because we don't say that was last time, this is now, <laughs> we reinforce it and reinforce it and reinforce it. Eventually, it just kind of gets deep into our psyche to the point that we can't get out of it anymore. We don't know all the associations. So what mindfulness does is it helps you break that down a little bit. It says, you're having this emotion with that thought, okay? Why are you linking those two together? And do you have to link them together? Can I just watch them? And what happens is when we just watch, we notice things kind of unlink. They start to unlink with each other. They start like, my, I don't have to feel bad every time I pick up my horn, even though that's what comes up. I can say, boy, I picked up my horn and I had this thought about this. I had this emotion. Okay, let me just watch that. It's not helpful right now. Mm. What would be a more, well, maybe I could just let that thought go. I'm not, I can't push it away. I can just question its validity and say, why don't I replace that with, I'm going to have a good practice session. Now, in the beginning, you're not going to believe that because the other thought's so powerful, right? And the emotional state. But after a time, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you retie a bad knot on, on, a, on a shoe? Well, first you have to unravel the knot. You first, mm. first of all, you have to be aware there's a knot that's a problem. You're like, this knot is screwed up. Yeah. Okay. I don't and you realize, oh, it's screwed up this way. And now that you've unbound it from the two, now you can bind it in a more elegant way. Mm. And that's the basic process that mindfulness does for us. It, it, it allows us to unbind things that we have habitually put together, states of mind and associations, and then decide, have more agency over what we decide. Is it perfect? Is it going to, you know, rep, does it take time? Yeah, it's ongoing. There isn't a day where I have mastered mindfulness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's a thing you have to do all the time. So there's no easy solution. But what I would say is that it's a more feasible solution. It's a kinder solution. And, and it's one that doesn't deny your feelings or injustices or things that have gone wrong. It doesn't deny any of that. It just gives you the option to relate to those things in a different way. Mm. I can't change the life that I had. I have had some difficult experiences I've had, but I can change what I do with that information that mm. I do have a choice over. Yeah. I, mean, I can say, yeah, I had a hard life, but you know what? You know, like I, I often think like I grew up very disadvantaged, didn't have lessons, very poor family. Um, you know, what was really mistreated in many ways during my first few years of teaching of going to school because I wasn't part of the culture. And I mean, I had some hard times. I'm still a little angry. I can, I feel angry when I think about that. I can sit there and say, oh, and, and project it to everybody. Or I can say, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do with that anger. I'm going to feel it. But I'm going to make sure that I'm mindful of the way that I might be creating that for somebody else. Mm. And so by being mindful of that, I can choose to act differently, not pass on these habits, that, the things that have happened to me. And by doing that, I make people's, my students' lives better, other people's lives better, which in turn does what? Makes my life better. Yeah. Right? It's reciprocal. Like it. It's relational, yeah. Okay, and that's interesting. People talk a lot. Also, I'm really just throwing all these different mindfulness <laughs> questions at you, parsing things out, and I appreciate it. People talk about like out-of-body experiences, and sometimes I feel like that gets taken really literally. Yeah. But I, or like metaphorically, but it seems like when you talk about it, it is an out-of-body experience in that you're becoming aware of these things that are, outside of your direct body awareness and how they've affected you and how you're reacting to them and how that's affecting like how you're reacting to the moment. Yeah. Does that make that's sense? A, yeah. That's a great say. So how does it, it so the, the question is, you know, 
how does this feel in experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's hard to put into words. But but one thing you are mentioning is that, yeah, you when when you practice mindfulness, you do notice that like this boundary between your body and the environment, and your emotions and your thoughts, it's more porous. It's more, um, things are more in, in an interactive space, right? So, so even though your body, of course, is your body and you're centered on earth as a physical being, yeah, duh. Um, that doesn't mean that everything is in your body in a sense. It means, you know, or better yet, in your experience, there are things that feel, are affected by your body, of course, but feel like they're not there. And what mindfulness is, is that it expands the horizon of that awareness. It, it allows you to open it up more and more and more so that everything comes in that mm-hmm. can possibly come in and you start to see relationships between those things. Cool. Right. And, and this particular, I mean, you can classify it a lot of different, I always classify it as physical sensations that are inside and outside mm-hmm. because okay. then, and then emotions. So it's sort of how I'm, how those feel positive, negative, et cetera. Um, and then thoughts associated with those physical sensations and emotions. Mm. Uh, uh, and then on a even more meta level narratives and stories because mm. we're storytelling people boy I, I, one yeah. of the funnest exercises i have is i i'll ask people to remember a, a, a kind of you know uncomfortable but not horrible event and then i start asking them questions about why that happened and tell me something about it. and then at the end i go you realize that's just a story you're telling yourself right you actually have no idea if any of that is true yeah but it is true. Well, you don't know that. You can say this happened, but all the story we built, and always, by the way, in every story, the other person wronged you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, you're always the, the hero. Yeah, and you're the hero, right? Or the victim, right? Like it, it's mm-hmm. it's one or the other. Now, of course, there are times you're victimized. Oh my gosh, let's not ignore that. There, are, I'm not ignoring that, right? Um, and there are times where, where, but, but, but we are also times where, where we cause the problems <laughs> mm-hmm. and it doesn't, it's not helpful to think of a life where we're free from ever causing anybody else. No, it's usually relational in some way, in some ways, some, again, I want to be really clear. Cause I don't want everyone to misunderstand me. Mm-hmm. There are people whose lives have been, they've been treated terribly. They've been victimized. Uh, they have legitimate trauma and concerns. And, and in those cases, we're not trying to reinterpret that to figure out how you contributed to that not what I'm saying. But on some level, there are a lot of things that we do do and the, that, that we contribute to that, that, that we build stories about ourselves that aren't helpful. Yeah. And by the way, the story doesn't change anything about what actually happened often, right? So it's a constant examination of perspective and story. Mm. But that's really where it happens culturally for us as how we tell these stories about certain things. Yeah. I mean, matter. And so many of those are assumptions of other details of the story that you assume because they reinforce a certain negative or positive emotion you have in the situation that, okay, that's awesome. And I love that. (laughs) I love that mindfulness can help you like be aware of that. Yeah. yeah. And again, you might decide the story is true. uh Uh-huh. But at least now you have like a better judgment of whether it is or not. And, and I want to be, here's what really helps me with that is that sometimes people want to tell your story for you. Mm. have a really vested interest in interpreting your life for you. And sometimes it's, they want to be helpful, but sometimes they're wanting to be the hero in your life and your advocate and your savior. We have to be really careful to put good boundaries up. You know, I've had experiences in my life where somebody's come up, well, what happened to you was this, 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 and this, and this. And if I believe what they're telling me, maybe it's true on some level, but Mm. then I have to ask, why, why are you interpreting that for me in that way? How does that serve you? Because if you really want to help me, you might ask me, how did you, how are you interpreting that in your life? Right? Yeah, Instead of, yeah. of, of position and very powerful people, very powerful, especially when we're in groups and in organizations, they tell stories about people that aren't the stories they want to tell about their lives. And, and we have to ask ourselves the ethical question, is that ethical? To, to especially for people who are, uh, uh, whose t- t- stories don't get told right, who are marginalized, for example, in one way or the other, you know, it's one thing to say, can't tell me your story. It's another thing to say, and the reason that happened is blah, 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 blah. And, and if you don't agree with me, then your story is wrong. Mm, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So now you've re-victimized the person by not mm. letting them interpret their story in a way, right? So, so you see, it's, it's tricky ethical ground, right? Yeah. It's not clear, it's something you check. It's not a box you check. It's an ongoing thing. Okay. I'm really curious about the like i guess the feeling of mindfulness of being really present and aware of all these things going on you know maybe i'm wrong about this and that's why i want to ask you 
I'm curious if there's a relationship to that between the experience that you have when you consume like art, really profound art that I feel like brings you into the realm of experience in in insane ways. Yes. You, yeah. Where's the overlap there? It, it, well, that's a great point. I mean, um, so I'll just, I'll make the following statement. Whenever you're fully engaged with art in a way, you're being mindful in some cool. way. Um, and, and a very specific type of mindfulness where you're fully immersed in, in the environment, right? There's really mm-hmm. no separation between your your sense of self and what's going on. Like you're just, something is happening and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's kind of taken its own, it's got its own momentum, right? Uh, a flow experience or an aesthetic experience, right? You know, when we, when we configure mindfulness as a practice, um, then that doesn't really fall into that definition. But we can, when we consider mindfulness as a range of experiences having to do with attention and emotion that are positive and, and which are immersive in some ways, then it makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're in an artistic space, right? Well, what happens? Well, our thoughts don't really capture what's going on. Our conceptualization is usually very limited. So often we don't want to talk. <laughs> yeah, we're like, right? So music has this, art has this beautiful way of sort of evoking a really powerful frame of meaning that doesn't need words. Even though we're going to add words to it anyway to communicate about it, right? You, you know, but, but, yeah. but it doesn't need the words. Actually, the words get in the way in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then if you're, you know, this could be perceiving art, also making art, right? You're so fully immersed, but if you're too self-aware, if you're constantly aware of what's going on during that moment, you, you, you get in the way, right? Because you're building a division between yourself. You're assuming your awareness and the thing that's going on are two separate things. They're not. They're dancing with each other, right? They're, your awareness is simply, you know, all the contents of what's going on in your mind at any given moment. So that's not where it is. It's mm-hmm. that you're noticing the relationship between these things. And in a state of art, what happens is that the, the, the way you're configured at a moment compared to that artwork immerses you in an environment that feels like time disappears in a way, like you're not really thinking about time, you're not time conscious. Um, uh, thoughts aren't as present. You don't even feel like a person. You feel like you're a part of a larger experience, right? Yeah. The so-called aesthetic experience. Um, so, so how does that relate to mindfulness? I think mindfulness taken from the perspective of, of I'm fully immersed in this moment right now in mm-hmm. everything that's happening, but I am not, I am not attaching myself to any particular thing in that moment, other than the fact that it's happening and it's relational. That, in a way, is is how mindfulness informs that sort of rich artistic experience that you're talking about, right? Yeah. So it's not so because if you overattach to any aspect of it, you break it. It's like have you ever had a dream and notice that you're in a dream? You're like, oh, cool, I'm in a dream, and then as minute you notice you're in a dream, you you wake up. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Some people have. Um, I don't. I can't say okay. if I have or not. I I yeah. tend not to remember my dreams for too long yeah and, and that's okay um you know everybody's configured differently mm-hmm. um or or you're oh what i'll tell you watching a movie yeah if you ever had the watching a movie it's a great movie and then all of a sudden you you become you become aware of the fact that it's just a movie and yes. as you become aware that it's just a movie you're like oh man those aren't real people and then it kind of ruins an experience for you mm-hmm. because now you've made you've separated this thing that's happening from your full experience you've created a a, a, a too much distance between the observer and the observed, right? But but what's happening during a great movie is that it's captivating you, and you almost feel like you're in it, yeah. Because your sense of self is not so tight. You're, you're you know you're imagining the space that you're interacting with, and you feel the characters, and you you can step back a little bit, but you don't want to get too focused on one character or one thing or one aspect of that experience. Because the minute you do, you create a division. Right? Yeah. Well, and it's nice because you spend so much time, like you said, obsessed with telling your own story. That then you can take a step back and be a part of someone else's story. But yeah, do you think a, a point where it's like unhealthy to spend too much time in someone else's story? Like, Absolutely. and I guess that's where I feel like art and entertainment diverge for me because, like, you, like, art is such an intense experience that I feel like you tend to come out naturally because it's so much to take in, whereas entertainment you could stay in with forever. We, I mean, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. I, I'm more, I, I'd rather ask you something else at the moment, but. But that's um, a good point, Tanner. I, yeah. think, I think you're onto something. Yeah. And, and, and art means so many different things. By the mm-hmm. way, there's nothing in the, my opinion, there's nothing in the art itself. Uh, it, it's the way that art re- 
and you as a person in your history collide mm -hmm. to create this experience. Yeah. Because some people don't have that experience at all um, based on particular sets of art, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing argument. You know, music music people get into that argument a lot. Well, that's a great piece. Well, it's not. Well, it's a, no, it just speaks differently based on your history or, or who you are and your time in life, right? Um, so yeah. that, but, 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 but in relationship to mindfulness is that you are certainly your, your state of time and self and embodiment is altered during that moment, maybe mm -hmm. through different mechanisms, maybe through the same. And I think mindfulness helps you get there in some ways. It's almost like it allows you, it, it, it sharpens skills that allow you to fall into that state, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm going to ask you one question that leads into a bigger question. How sure. do you think that the art that you practice in music tool of deep listening, of like yeah. really taking apart and being aware of everything going on in a recording how close to mindfulness is that? Deep listening is mindfulness on some level, right? Okay. I mean, so so the the difference here, right, is is um, you know, and there's 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 sort of the Pauline Oliveros uh, conception of deep listening, and you know, there, there's different things that people mean by deep listening. Um, uh, but but I do feel like to the I didn't know who that was, so I got to look that up. But I'll, <laughs> I'll put links to it. All right, great. Um, you know, the, the, the aspect of this is that my, you know, uh, deep listening is using uh, sound as the object of attention, like the mm -hmm. stabilizing object, but realizing that sound evokes a complete landscape of feeling in your body, even images, it relates to what's going on. Um, it relates, you know, there's so much going on. And what you do is that instead of saying, I'm just going to listen to what intervals are happening, or I'm just going to sort of follow a whimsy is that you maintain awareness of all the things that are happening when that piece of music is activated in your environment. Mm -hmm. right? That, that to me is what deep listen, and you sustain that you, you bring your mind back when it, it, when it goes to who knows what, right? And by the way, that's the difference between mind wandering and mindfulness, right? There's nothing wrong with mind wandering, but when you're mind wandering, you're you're gone from the what's happening in the moment, and you are following now a stream of thought that takes you some something. So you become overly uh, concerned with a particular thought. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's how creativity happens, right? Yeah. But yeah. if my intention is to sit here and really take something in, then that's not helpful. Um, I might have a different experience if I just remind myself to be present with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And, and as you notice, sometimes during deep listening, you're like, oh man, my body feels a certain way and my emotions feel a certain way. And look how it's coloring my environment. It, uh, you know, there's nothing, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of listening to music on an airplane and having a beautiful piece of music come up and then you look outside and see that beautiful piece of music has all sorts of connotations in another situation, in a concert hall, on a headphones, but now you're looking outside and there's this panoramic view of, of, the, of the earth. Right, and I remember having this uh, experience uh, listening to one of, my, one of my favorite pieces is uh, Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Six. I love that okay. piece, and you know sometimes I listen to it when I'm it sort of reinforced a dark mood, uh, you know. I, I but, but one day I heard it on my ear. I woke up from a nap and it was on, a headphones, and I was looking over all of this mountain range, and there was something just about that moment that immersed me. And I was like, gosh. This is, I'm experiencing it completely different, which means I'm not ignoring any aspect of my environment and causing this to happen. But the basis is what? Sound, sound. The, the listening part is the part that glues it all together. Mm. Okay. So I feel like lately I'm, I just get worried and frustrated about the state of like entertainment and art. And it seems like everyone is so stressed out all the time that, like experiencing these high broadband levels of art that are like, I don't know, however, wh whatever you want to put in that category, but like symphonies and more just stuff that challenges you, right? Yeah. It's hard to convince people to do that because everyone's lives are super challenging and it's so much easier to, to consume something that's, that's less challenging, right? And I, I can't help but feel like there's also this, at the same time, this wave of mindfulness or uh, maybe that's not a good way to put it there's a lot of buzz around mindfulness and people are interested in it right now a craze maybe in in the u.s and if there is if there's a way to combine people who are interested in mindfulness through a deep listening way to get people more connected with music because i feel like so many people that i know that aren't musicians just feel like i don't understand music at all 
sure. which is so sad. And this would be a huge opportunity to not only just correct that injustice because it's not true, but also give people the tools to feel like they are capable because they are of consuming like high level music. And obviously there's a lot of value judgments there, but I, I, I believe it because I've experienced that music in a way that I believe in just the, sure. the truth of it. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, do you think there's I, something there? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I might have some, um, some differences in how I would conceptualize uh, high or complex or anything, but, but, mm -hmm. but I'll agree with you with this. I mean, there's certain, it is certainly challenging for many reasons to listen to uh, certain types of Western art music uh, that we that we talk about, um, like symphonies, uh, some uh, jazz. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, it, it requires a particular way of attending that is different mm -hmm. than when you're being entertained. And I like being entertained too. I like both. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I, so, and I guess to, only to that point, I just feel like there's so much emphasis on entertainment. Sure. And not sure. very much on the other side these days. Yeah. And, and by the way, some people for some of the things that I find entertaining other people get a deep response from. So mm. I want to point that whatever I say here doesn't have to do any, any, any quality of the, of the art itself, but how we relate to that artwork and whether we're going to have a particular experience. Now, what yeah. you said though is interesting because um, I do feel that if you're going to get a good experience in the world of classical music, there is a certain degree of mindful attention that you have to have in order to, to, to really experience it. Um, and, and, and that takes some training, right? And some people mm -hmm. just get that. So, so the question of where do we do that? Yeah. So, you know, just this year, me, Jeremy Allen, um, uh, John Raymond, the field of us had these really interesting uh, outdoor concerts that did exactly what you're talking about. We, uh, we performed outdoors. We had them play uh, uh, jazz, classical, all sorts of different things. And I guided them through mindfulness outdoors. So it became so a sort cool. of, right? And so, you know, um, we had okay attendance. Some people uh -huh. came out, probably pandemic is, is gonna put a damper on that. Um, and, you know, one of the things we started off for right off the bat is we're not coming, we're not here for you to try to understand. I mean, we're not trying to get you to understand this music in a particular, let go of the idea that you have to understand what's going on. Yes, yes. But but get more into how what is this evoking for you right now physically mm -hmm. mentally everything else and just stay with that just stay with that and it might not be you know sometimes your mind might go away, uh, but that's what the mindfulness test was right um, so that's one way to do it uh, mindful I'm, I actually just curated an entire um, set of mindfulness tests for the Eskenazi Museum so if you go to Eskenazi now there are mindful exhibits and what you do is you sit in the exhibit instead of just watching it you put your headphones on and uh, there are scripts that I created for different pieces of art. And uh, my friend uh, Eric Dixon recorded, and their five-minute guided mindfulness to do exactly mm. what you do. Now, in that oh, case, that's it's so cool. Deep observing, right, with your eyes, but you could do the same thing with music. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're not, you know, you have to be careful because sometimes the narrative of that interrupts what's going on, right? So there's a space where we guide, and there's a space where we we just develop habits and let go. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's some teachers that teach that way. I think there's some people who, you know, it's not an analytical framing of what we're doing. And, 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 you know, that I think is a big mistake musicians have made, especially classical, um, people who are oriented into the so-called classical realm, and sometimes jazz. We think that if we explain it to people, they'll like it more, or they'll mm. enjoy it more. Yeah. And, and in a way, maybe we, we understand more about it. I don't know that that's the route. I'm not saying you get rid of that. I mean, of course, understanding something can really enlighten you about a particular framing of a piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the same as experiencing it. Definitely. It's not the same as really, really dropping your, 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 your ego and yourself in a certain moment of, of encountering a work of art and letting it sort of play with you, right? So the art works on you and the things that you already have and the mind state that you're in. I think that is a key to what you're talking about. And, um, and it's a way to get people to want to do the things that you're, that you're talking about. And, so yeah. like, and also acknowledging some people will never do it and that's okay. For sure. It's not their, it's not their, my mom, never going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that all makes sense. I guess, yeah. And to me, it's just so sad that so much of the music that I care about, people have like a preconceived notion that they don't like. Right. Or, and people like hit, will hit play and they've already decided if it's bad or not, you know? Yeah. And They're mindfulness would, yeah. It, and it's just, <laughs> if it's only sad because like you, like you might've really enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm so excited about the the possibility that this could be a tool for people to just enjoy music more, no matter what it is that you listen to. Yeah. 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 And, and um, 
you're right. We, we, the minute we have a preconceived notion of something, it's going to be really hard to get past that. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and this does give you an opportunity to say, look, may, maybe your preconceived notions are right for just a minute. Just be curious though. Don't force them. Though. Just, just stay curious. Stay curious about what this is evoking. Guide them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. There's so much going on. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of it doesn't register with something that we've heard other than, you know, for, for some people, uh, a commercial or, you know, some, some souped up weird movie about art music and art and classical music where everyone's stuffy and boring and over analytical i mean there's so much there already that's provided by popular culture we it's like we were fighting several battles yes exactly yeah but 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 you're right um how you get people to teach it that way though um without thinking that they're losing the analytical aspect that's 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 a that's a culture shift and the Mm -hmm. way that we talk about art and music um and uh you know yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, the more the more preconceived notions you have, the worse it's going to be. Mm-hmm. I really appreciated through the whole thing that this has helped me think about it. But I, you, I tend to have thought about mindfulness as this process of knowing and like figuring things out. But it seems more like it's a process of becoming curious and being okay with not knowing things. And that's kind of the point. Unknowing, right? It's beginner's mind. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't have information and that you, you know, that you start every moment completely fresh. I mean, gosh, if you have to learn to walk every time you take a step, that would be useless. It's not mm-hmm. what we're talking about. Of course, you gain knowledge, right? But it's also being aware enough to change, it, it, maintaining curiosity and a don't know mind so that you can see what's going on in front of you. And, you know, w- what you find out after that is that things are actually much more interesting then you probably imagine they are when you mm. let go of your preconceived notions. It's like, this is interesting. Maybe, you know, there's a way things relate to each other. And the, I mean, there's so much going on in our environment. We can't take it all in. And sometimes we are not mindful, right? Sometimes it's okay. You know, like people are like, should you be mindful all day? No, that's like, you know, should you eat all day? Cause it's good for you. No, you know, yeah. there's there are things that there are <laughs> moments of our lives that we need to do that in. And, and as a general practice, it's good. <laughs> But, but yeah, it's about not knowing. It's really about bringing back that sort of beginner's mind that, that makes life interesting and curious in a lot of ways, even when it's, even when it's hard. That's even awesome. when it can yeah. be difficult. So, yeah. I love it. And I, I can't thank you enough for all of this. It's just fantastic. Before we're done, if you want to let the listeners know where to find you online, projects <laughs> or resources you have, things you want them to be aware of, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I used to, you know, I know we have an institute, a mindfulness institute that is a little bit on hiatus right now because of the um, mm-hmm. of the uh, uh, pandemic. And so, you know, typically I, I direct people there because we have a, a bunch of cool stuff, but uh, don't go there right now because it's just <laughs> lots of st- talk about static pictures and static relationships. Uh, but if you want to look, uh, you know, if you want to find some meditations, some talks and things, you know, uh, there's a few things. If you Google Frank Diaz and mindfulness, uh, you're going to get at least some some podcasts that have come up recently. One that I particularly like was with Richard Wolf. It's it's called Wolf in Tune, uh, Music as a Bridge to Mindfulness is a book that he wrote. It's a great, I, I really enjoyed that interview. Uh, you can just Google Wolf Diaz mm-hmm. um, and, and you know that'll give you some insights. And then there's just other stuff online. Apparently people have recorded me when I do these things and they show up on YouTube. They show up on the YouTubes, you know where the kids are. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, every, every once in a while I'm like, oh, check that out, that's my face, I must be saying something. Uh, so if you want more information, uh, that's where it is right now. It's sort of in, a, in an unorganized repository of people posting things online about mindfulness. Yeah, amazing. Uh, we, we do hope to get that. Um, we do hope eventually to get the Institute back up and have yeah. some resources, or resources there for musicians that are really useful. Awesome. Well, sweet. Thank you again. It's fantastic. Thank you, Tanner. Okay, that does it for this episode of the Happy Musicians podcast. You can find links to everything we talked about and some of my favorite web offerings from Frank at thehappymusicians.com. There I have all the podcast episodes broken down into categories so that you can easily find the best episode for you right now. There's also a blog section with targeted essays on the various issues and topics that come up in this show. There's a free weekly music recommendation service called Fresh Picks. And I have an online store. I sell hoodies and t-shirts and practice fuel mugs and positivity posters. And not only do you get a high quality product to brighten up your day, 
but you really support the podcast. And if you don't have the funds to do that right now, I totally understand. There are a multitude of free and easy ways to promote this show, like just sharing it with a friend, texting it to a buddy, letting them know about it. You can follow us on social media at The Happy Musicians and share a post there. And again, the single most impactful way you can help the show is to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That's all I have. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again next week. And until then, stay happy.